in advance for my voice so it's trying to steal my shine um, I, I was very impressed to see what was presented this morning everything was so animated it was so beautiful right um, so a lot was mentioned about computers automation cyberspace technology and all of that but like one of the things that is crippling to all these things I'll start my presentation by just saying, so without power, we do agree that none of these things can happen, right? So this presentation is basically presenting, so I did my research, my master's at VETS, and basically what my research was about is trying to find a cost-effective way of supplying power. The thing about power lines is they are a very high investment but a low return type of asset. So what this presentation proposes is a cost saving that is related to series capacitor banks. I'd just like to check how many people in the audience are familiar with power lines or concepts that are related to power transmission. Is there anyone? In the, okay. So, so basically, what we are talking about here is a pursuit to actually try and find cost-effective, more reliable, and more efficient methods to to transmit power. And basically, what we are saying is, you know, a conventional way that is used to actually optimize a power transmission line is to use series compensation. What that refers to is actually this, what you see in the presentation at the beginning, which is basically series capacitor banks. And the challenge that, we, that I mentioned earlier is that power lines are actually a high cost, low return type of assets, acquiring servitudes. Is, um, is, is, is one of our biggest challenges. Everybody wants to take a hot shower in the morning. Guess what? Nobody wants to have a power line next to their house. What must happen? We all want to have a hot shower, but nobody wants to have a power line close to their house. So this is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing as power line designers. Um, Keith mentioned uh, 3D modeling, so we actually have resorted to actually modeling our designs in 3D to actually show the landowners what it would look like post um, construction. So what typically this looks like, I don't want to bore you with that if you don't do power lines, but this is typically what a power line looks like if you are to represent it in terms of symbols. And this is what a series capacitor would be. And in real life, if you drive by the road, that's what it would look like. Now, the thing with a series capacitor is, it is a beautiful device because it is self-regulating. It actually needs, it gives you what you need. So it gives you exactly the amount of reactive power that you need at the time that you are transmitting the power. So not many um, devices are this powerful because what things tend to do is they give you a constant amount of X. Just like this bottle, it says it's written 500 mils. Luckily you can seal it if you want to drink 300 mils. So a series capacitor's powerful advantage is that it is a self-regulating device, so it gives you what you need. And then basically if you are building lines in parallel, it affords you the ability to improve your load sharing. So in other ways, in other um, words, if you are building lines in parallel, you are able to effectively share the power. And then again, we are saying they are only achieving this by reducing the series inductive reactance of the line. Now what we are presenting here, or rather what my research is, like, is, is about, which is 
made me very happy to see Keith mention the power lines that are coming up, up in Africa is we are saying we have actually found techniques and methods that can eliminate the installation of a series capacitor bank on the transmission line. And what these methods are known as is high surge impedance loading methods. So what these methods do, just like the series capacitor bank, is they reduce the series inductive reactance of the line and parallel to that they also increase the series shunt capacitance of the line. So the, the natural power transfer capacity of the line is increased. So depending on the case that you are building, you can actually eliminate that series capacitor bank. So if we go back to theory, back to varsity, we know that the fewer components you have in a system, the higher the reliability of the system is, right? Because even in terms of maintenance, you do not need to, comp to maintain that component. So why, what high SIL methods are made up of is basically these. You can increase the number of subconductors in the bundle. So I think it is fit to mention that ideally, how power lines are designed is that safety is the leading criteria, right? So because they are so expensive, the way you design them is you take care of safety. The leading criteria that you take care of is safety. Right, But now, given the cost constraints that we are facing in South Africa, we have come to, play, to, to a point where we say, how best can we optimize the existing steel, the existing foundations we are using, the towers, the number of, just changing the configuration of the existing structure, how much more power can I push in the structure? So high SIL say, I can increase the number of subconductors, I can open up the bundle spacing, so meaning to say, so it's a pity I don't have a, a, a picture of a power transmission line, but most of you have actually driven by the highway and you've seen those steel structures, right? They're very big ones that are looking gray, so they typically look like they're gray. And then what they look like, they have three phases, Right, so you'll see three lines going across, and then there's typically two lines at the top of the three. Do you guys not even look at the power lines? Oh my God, shame on you. <laughs> Do you know, without that structure, you are not getting a hot shower. I get so upset because people do not even know that without power transmission lines, there is, people are constantly talking about generating power. I'm like, excuse me, the transmission line is the heart of the system. You can generate all you want, but if you do not transmit that power from where it is generated to the load, there is no hot shower. Guys, please do me a favor. Next time you drive past that thing, it is no longer a thing, right? Now we know it is a power transmission. And it is critical to note, power transmission lines are those big ones, right? They go from Joburg to Cape Town, so they're typically gray, they're massive. And then your, trans, your distribution lines are the wood poles. Typically they're wood poles, so it's the ones you see close to your house, right? And then those that obviously stay in the suburbs, you never even see any power lines, because it's cables. The cables are under your house, they, they, it's beautiful. So guys, what I'm referring to is next time you drive, you will see that thing's got three phases. So it's one, two, three, and then at the top it's got two other wires, so those are F wires. So when I talk about the subconductors, I'm talking about one of those three, right? So the number of conductors in that bundle is what I'm referring to there. The spacing between the subconductors in the bundle is very critical to the series impedance of that line. Phase compaction refers to the distance between the three. Right? So guys, this is why I'm here, right? You wanna switch on your computer, you wanna print 3D, what, what, what? You have no power. <laughs> Sharp, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. So me, I'm just trying to see how best we can give you the cheapest power so that you can do what you need to do. That's what I'm trying to do. So, thank you, Keith. When you do that Africa power, remember me, right? So I've got, I've got a solution here. So, so fortunately what I've done is I did, I did actually think not many people actually work with power transmission lines. So I did put some illustration 
of what I'm trying to refer to when I say compacting the phases. So when you drive from Bumalanga to Joburg, you see those structures and typically they're like this. They are flat, right? Most of us, we see them. It's three phases that are flat like that. So what you need to do if you want to optimize, you don't want to increase the size of the servitude. I want to put this power line behind your house. So I'm sorry, I want to put it. So I'm just saying to you, I'm going to push more power without buying a bigger servitude. If I want to do that, I'm going to change this flat configuration to be a delta. <coughs> We've got more power to the load, we distribute to more people, we don't bother you much more. So this is what we refer to phase compaction. Next time you can actually sound clever to someone, say, hey, that is a horizontal, how about we compact those phases to push more power? Hey, you become a superhero, eh? <laughs> Then we're talking about the number of subconductors. So remember what I said, when you drive past, you will see three of these. These are what we call a phase. So a typical power transmission line is made up of three phases. So what I was referring to by increasing the number of subconductors in the bundle is exactly that, right? For those who are electrical engineers, you naturally know if you increase the number of conductors, you reduce resistance, so your losses drop and the likes. So one of the techniques for high SIL is to increase the number of subconductors in the bundle. And then one of the most powerful techniques in the high SIL uh, space is what we refer to as bundle expansion. What bundle expansion is, is just keeping the same number of subconductors in the bundle and then you just open up the spacing. So if you look at your um, ionizing and non-ionizing field effects, there is a limit as to how far you can open this up, but you can actually buy yourself some margin of increasing your SIL just by opening up the, the, the bundle spacing. So the, the beauty about this method is you can actually um, so given the current economic situation, one of our biggest um, goals is to upgrade existing lines. So I don't wanna buy new servitude, I don't wanna buy new structures, I don't wanna put up new foundation. I wanna use exactly what's on the ground, but I wanna push more power per character. This method allows you to do that. I keep the same structures, all I do is I expand the bundle at mid span. So by mid span, I mean between two structures. So if this is one tower, that's another tower. I keep the same configuration at the structure. As I come down the structure, I open it up. As I go back, I close it down. And just by doing that, you are able to push even 100 more megawatts in that line. Then of course, varying the number of subconductors in the bundle, it all depends whether you, your line is thermally constrained or you've got stability problems on it or you've got voltage constraints, but you could totally do that. And then we were talking about SIL, so I thought after the Queen, you know, do you guys watch the Queen or Aspire? So after the Queen, you could totally brush up on your line theory. And uh, so this is just a slide that says, I'm talking to you about high SIL theory, so it is only fair that I give a formula of what SIL is. And then I keep talking about series inductance of the line. So basically I'm talking to about that component. It is fair to mention that most of the lines in South Africa are actually long. Not because of we are pushing a lot of power as such, but it's mostly because our generating stations are so far from the load. That is the biggest reason why our lines are long. So what we find is voltage collapse is actually our biggest constraint, and that's the series capacitor. So these high SIL methods allow you to actually reduce that, increase that, which is the natural, the natural reactive power of the line, and then um, you are able to eliminate um, compensation. So typically what happens is, you know, a 400 kV line, most of our lines in South Africa are 400 kV, but if you're coming from Joburg going down to the Cape, because as we all know, most of the Cape is supplied by Mpumalanga, then the only source they have there is the nuclear station Kuberg. You will observe that 
if you are around Gauteng, uh, Natal, most of the lines are 400 kV. So 765 is basically the only backbone between Joburg and I mean Pumalang and the Cape. So typically our 400 kV lines are built with 310 conductors. So if you drive by, most of the time you're going to see a phase with three, three conductors. But we are saying Keith is about to build an interconnector which is probably going to be 400. In Africa, they haven't even gone as far as 400, but we are going to tell them, you do not need to go as far as 765. You can still go 400. Instead of doing your typical 310 with a 450 millimeter spacing, you can do 410 conductor, open up that bundle, and you can push way more power in that same line. So this is equivalent to smaller servitude, smaller structures, smaller insulation, and this is basically beautiful, you know, you can save money. And I think in Africa, they haven't actually come to be aware of this term high SIL, simply because high SIL is a concept that is, that has only been implemented, I think, in India and in Brazil. So no other country, uh, um, countries in the world have actually implemented it. So I think the interconnectors that are coming up in Africa will be a very good scope for these lines. So basically we're just saying natural capacity of the line as it's built is X. If you use high SIL methods, you are able to actually boost that natural capacity by 3.5%, which translates into 33% in terms of the reactive power requirements of that line. And then, let's see. So in this particular, in my uh, master's, I, I did a case. It's a line from Mpumalanga to Maputo, right? And that line is actually retrofitted with series capacitor banks. So what I did is I used high SIL methods to see if that capacitor could have been eliminated at the time of design. And in fact, if high SIL concepts were known at that time, we would have saved a whole 8.5 million dollars. So high SIL methods are actually very feasible and I think one of the biggest advantages with it is environmental impacts because for you to install a series capacitor you need a piece of land yet again it's somebody's land and nobody wants to give away their land. So I think series capacitor banks, uh, the need for them is actually coming to an end soon. I hope a supplier of cap banks is not in the room. Yeah, so I'm just saying in closing, the advantages of actually eliminating a series capacitor bank, as we've mentioned, is capital costs. You save a lot in terms of capital cost, even the maintenance, because once you don't have the component, you don't need to maintain it. The reduced environmental impact, you don't need to buy that land, you don't need to negotiate with someone who's pointing a gun at you, because guns don't intimidate me anymore. <laughs> Many times someone came out, what are you doing on my farm? I said, do you want to have hot water when you wake up? They say yes. I say, say we need to talk. 